Okay, welcome to film literature. We're going to be watching a lot of movies, but not this week. Um, so first, let me show you what's on the course website so that you know what resources you have. Uh, then I'll start talking about the course, and then I will pass out the handout, and we're going to start talking about the handout. We have three hours today. It's fine. Lots of time. No rush. Okay, so uh, everything you will need is on Moodle. If you need to contact me, send me an email. If you want to join teams for some reason and you're not already in our class teams, you can add yourself using this code. Uh, then we have the syllabus. What are we doing this semester? Oh wait, not this one. Uh, this one. What are we doing this semester? So first week introduction to the course films and filmmaking. I'm doing that now. Next week we're going to watch a movie. Uh, we're going to watch the only non-English movie of the semester. It, we're an English department. I know we're supposed to watch English movies, but there really is no substitute for Francois Truffaut's Day for Night. Um, I can't remember the Chinese title. Uh, or something like that. I can't remember. Um, but it's a movie about filmmaking. Uh, you know, I can talk all day about how to make a film and the different parts, uh, and I will talk about them, but there's nothing better than actually seeing a movie about making a movie. So that's next week. It's in French, uh, so I will give you Chinese subtitles and English subtitles. I know some of you may not uh, read Chinese very quickly, uh, hopefully you can read English slightly faster. Um, and it's only two hour movie, so we'll have another hour next week. Uh, so if I don't finish today's lecture, I will finish it next week. If I do finish today's lecture, we will talk about documentaries. And the reason we have we're going to talk about documentaries is because week three, we're going to watch. A documentary. Uh, and it's also about making movies, but look at the year, right? Day for Night was made in 1973. Some things have changed since 1973. Um, so the documentary Side by Side, which is made in 2012, will be about the, uh, the shift to digital filmmaking. So not actually using physical film celluloid, uh, like a camera, but using digital um, equipment and editing software and how that has changed filmmaking. Starting week four, we enter our regular weekly pattern. We're going to watch a roughly two hour movie. And then in the third hour, you will uh, discuss some prepared discussion questions with your classmates. Um, so after we finish watching side by side in week three, we will have one more hour and I we will use that time to divide you into groups and those will be your groups for the semester. Um, I will explain in just a bit why these groups are so important, not just for discussion. So uh, week three documentary split into groups, weeks four, five, uh, weeks four and five and six. Uh, yeah, this, this is slightly incorrect. Weeks four, five and six, we are going to watch a movie and then discuss with your groups. And then, um, I, you know, I'll walk around listen to your thoughts, uh, and then I will share your ideas with the rest of the class. These discussion questions will be open-ended. There will be no standard answer. 
uh, there there will be no right or wrong answer. There will be better or worse answers, but no outright right or wrong answer. So feel free to express your ideas and discuss with your classmates and to have fun. Now, these movies I have not seen before. Uh, I chose I have chosen the movies, but I have not seen them before. I chose movies that I heard were good or important or like we should watch, right? Um, that have some kind of value. So it could be we might watch a very bad movie. We don't know. How fun. Uh, and so for the same reason, I have not yet written the discussion questions. So what's really going to happen is uh, starting week four, right? I get here, I prepare the movie, the bell rings, we play the movie, and then right after it finishes, you guys will have a 10 minute break. I will come over here and write five discussion questions. Uh, and after I finish writing them, we go on to the third hour and you immediately discuss those questions while I run to go to the bathroom. Now, week uh, eight. This is wrong. There's no discussion on week eight, right? The discussion is week nine. The reason there's no discussion on week eight is because week eight, we're going to watch a three hour movie. Right? We have three hours. We should make good use of it. Um, so week eight is a longer movie. Week nine, you will discuss that movie and then I will introduce the midterm exam. The exam will be an open ended take home exam uh, essay question that you will answer on Moodle. Open ended open book. It won't be hard to do, but um, there will be enough difficulty so that the grades will actually matter. And you will have one week to go home and take the midterm exam. Actually, let me tell you what the exam question is. Uh, it's one essay question, and the question is, please watch this short film. Then uh, answer the question, how does it make you feel and why does it make you feel that way? So the first part, how does it make you feel? That's very open ended. There's no wrong answer here. In the past, I've even had students say I didn't really feel anything. That's fine. But then you have to answer the second part. Why? Uh, and this part I will ask you to mention at least four different elements of filmmaking. Acting, directing, editing, sound design, visual effects, story, message, production design, at least four. So again, no wrong answers as long as you are able to connect what you see with at least four of these ideas that we talk about in class. In fact, uh, when I say in class, I mean today. I, I'm tr probably going to finish the filmmaking lecture today. Um, so that's the midterm exam. The only thing you don't know is what is the short film. Uh, and so I will announce that in week nine. Week 10, we're back to our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, 10, 11, 12, 13 are all watch a two hour movie, discuss. Week 14 is the same thing, but it will be a horror movie, 恐怖片. Uh, I put this on the syllabus because I know that some of you, like me, do not like to watch horror movies. I don't like to go to the theater and spend two hours getting scared the fuck out of myself. But it's important. Horror is a very important kind of movie. It has a very important place in cinema history. There are some things that only a horror movie can do that other movies cannot, and I'm not talking about scare you. I mean things like symbolism, imagery, messaging. Uh, so we do have to watch at least one horror movie and then discuss. Week 15, it says student chosen. 
Now, I did prepare a movie. But I'm hoping that you guys can share your love of cinema with me and the rest of the class. During the semester, you can recommend movies to me uh, to choose to play in week 15. Um, there are a few limitations, right? Cannot be pornography. Cannot be like a, an actual death on movie. Um, has to be in English. Has to be under 130 minutes. And I have to be able to actually find the movie with Chinese subtitles. Um, so if it fulfills all of these criteria, uh, feel free to recommend it to me and I will prepare to play it in week 15. Week 16, we have another long film, so we'll discuss that in week 17. And then week 18, it says final project. Oh no, what is this? OK, so this is why you need to have small groups. The final project is that your group is going to make a short film. Uh, it can be any kind of short film, again, that is not pornography, that is not illegal, right? Um, and we'll get into the details later, but for now you should know that there is a big project that you and your team will have to spend time doing outside of class. And so week 18 is when you guys get to show your film to the rest of the class, and the rest of the class will help to give you a score. Um, I'll talk about that a little later. Now, the only learning guidance I have for you is that the final project will take more time than you anticipate. So I tell you it's going to take longer than you think. So you're thinking, OK, I need to plan ahead. But let me say that it's going to take even longer than you think, even when I tell you it's going to take longer than you think. So you should really plan ahead. This is not something you can finish in three days. Uh, um, please don't try to finish in three days. Um, no textbook. The only textbook is the handout, which I will pass out later. And then finally, the grades. Midterm, 40%. Final project, 40%. Attendance, 20%. So I designed this so that if you screw up your midterm or your final project, it is still possible to pass. Or like there are some rules for the midterm exam, and if you don't follow those rules, you will have a very low score, but you can still pass if you do a good job on your final project and you come to class. So how do I calculate attendance? It, it says 20%, right? So 20 points. Every week that you are not here and you don't take leave, jia, I will take away three points, three out of 20. Uh, if you use 100 points every week, you're not here and you don't take leave, I will take away 15 points from your daily grade. Um, so as long as you take leave, you're fine. You know, sick leave, personal leave, sija. If you have a reason and you go through the school system and you take leave, your attendance grade will be fine. OK, questions about the syllabus? OK, so let's look at the next thing. Class emails, if there's something I need to tell you, um, and it can't wait for the next class, I will send an email to everybody. Um, this goes to whatever email you set up on the student information system. If you if you go onto the information system and you put in your personal email, um, apparently the email will go to your personal email account. But if you don't do that, it will go to your school email account. I know not everybody checks uh, their school email account every day. 
So when I, if I do write something, I will update this title. I, I will add like the date of the late and title of the latest message so that, so that you know there is a new message. Next, um, you might have noticed that I am recording this. And the reason I'm recording it is because then after class I can upload it to YouTube. And the reason I want to upload it to YouTube is because YouTube will then generate an automated transcript. So not just these subtitles, but an actual document of everything that I say. And that transcript is searchable. So if you need to rewatch one week's lecture uh, and you only need one part, you don't have to watch all three hours. You can search the transcript and jump to the part that you need. Uh, it saves you a lot of time. Um, but it usually takes one day for YouTube to do this. So when you see a new video link on Moodle uh, and you need the transcript, you might have to wait one day. Next, this is a link to a OneDrive folder. Uh, and in this folder, I will put the um, the first two movies we want. We're going to watch day for night and side by side. And then uh, for the weekly movies, I will upload the four most recent weekly movies. In the past, I uploaded everything. But starting last semester, the school said, oh, each teacher only has 25 GB storage, so I can't fit everything. So I'm just going to upload the four most recent films. Um, so if you have to miss a class, you don't have to miss the movie. Unless you wait for more than a month. Um, if you do have to watch a movie at home. The thing each movie has two files, the movie file and the subtitles file. Some people don't know how to add subtitles to a movie, so I have recorded a short YouTube video to teach you how to do this. In fact, if you uh, for Windows, I don't know how to use an Apple computer. If you use an Apple con uh, computer, good luck. Um, but for Windows, uh, this is one way to do this, but in fact on Windows, the the default video player does not have subtitles function. So in fact, this video starts by showing you how to download another video player. Uh, and using that video player, you can then add subtitles. The next thing is a YouTube playlist. It has, I think, 12 videos. These are all videos that I think could be useful if you are interested in learning more about films and filmmaking. Some of uh, they're all in English. Some of them have subtitles. Some of them do not. Some of them are 10 minutes. Some of them are two hours. Uh, if you're interested, you can take a look. Uh, and then this is the place I will enter your attendance grade. You can't see this. OK, so these are the uh, the files and the information that you will need for the whole semester. Next, uh, this is the stuff that we will be using for the first three weeks. The first one is just for your reference, right? What can literature do? It's in Chinese. It's a very good article in Chinese. Um, this class is called film literature, and to me that means that we're going to be looking at films like they are literature. So if you're a bit confused about why you have to study literature at an applied English department, you can take a look at this article. Uh, the next one is the handout. I will pass that out now. Or not now, I'll pass it out a little later. Uh, if you forget to bring it or you lose it or your dog eats your handout, um, you can find a PDF here. Now every week, um, after we watch the movie, after we discuss it, um, I will go home and, you know, I like to read about movies a lot. I also write about movies. I'm actually the only film critic in Taiwan to be listed on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, 
But I'll go home and I'll read about the movie we just watched, and I'll pick I, what I think is the best piece of writing, and I'll upload it to YouTube, uh, upload it to Moodle, sorry, along with the recording of our class discussion. Now, I have seen the first two movies before. It, you know, that's why I added them to the class. So I have already picked what I think are the two best pieces of writing uh, for these two movies. So if you're interested, you can read those. When I choose these pieces of writing, I don't really worry about is it easy to read? Uh, how long is it? I choose just the one I think is the best. So some of them will be two pages. Some of them might be 20 pages. It depends. Um, so that's just for your reference. First half, this is where I will upload the videos, the PowerPoints, and uh, the pieces of writing for the films in the first half of the semester. Midterm exam, long list of rules. We will go through these rules um, when I introduce the midterm exam. Uh, and all of this stuff I will talk about then. Here's the short film. You can't see this, but it's already here. Uh, here's where the second half stuff will go, and then the final project. So here are the rules. I'll remind you uh, later also, but just for now, here's a short introduction. Make a short film under 15 minutes long in English or Chinese or both with both English and Chinese subtitles. So the language that you speak can be English or Chinese, but the language of the subtitles, the words on the screen, have to use both English and Chinese. Up, uh, when you're done, upload it to YouTube. And in week 18, you have to send somebody to the stage to introduce your short film. Uh, then you will play the short film for us. And then uh, you whether the person you send or the whole group will answer questions about your short film. Uh, the 40% grade will be calculated half by me. I'm responsible for 20% and half by your classmates. So all the other groups will give a grade to each film. And this explains how to do this. Uh, you also have to give a grade to your own group members. So like how much did they do? How important were they to this project? How much did they contribute? The grade that you give your own group members will not be directly calculated into your final grade. It's just to tell me if something's wrong. And then if there is something wrong, I can adjust the individual scores. Um, so no pressure, right? You don't have to worry, oh, if I give them a three or a two, will they fail the course? No, I'll I'll think about what's going on. Um, yeah, so if you're interested, you can go read this. I will talk about this more in week 17. Finally, we have this thing. If you have taken my classes before, this used to be called bonus. And there used to be only one thing. Uh, but I decided this semester to change it into two things. So if you want extra credit, there are two types. The first type is if you don't think you're going to pass the course and you want to pass the course, you need the extra points to pass, then you can do this last chance quiz. It is uh, a single, very, very open ended essay question. And the explanation will be in the quiz. Now, the other type is if you think you are going to pass and you just want a higher grade, then you can do the more traditional uh, extra credit. Read the essay, write a uh, reflection, blah, blah, blah. The, the instructions are all here. Now, the second type will look at your word count. Uh, let's see. 
1,000 English or 2,000 in Chinese or other languages, if I use Google Translate, has to turn into 1,000 English. So uh, because we have to look at the word count, I have to warn you, if you write your answer using Google Docs, be careful about this error. Can you see what's wrong? What is the error? OK, how many words are highlighted? Two, but it says five. And this is because uh, in this error, each letter is counted as a word. Um, so, you know, if you think, oh, I already have 1000 words, it turns out you only have 200. Now, how can you tell if this is the issue? Look at this. This is the beginning of a line. It, it's only one letter. Like what's going on here? And look at this. This is not the beginning of this word either. Um, because each letter is counted as its own word, um, the computer has no problem breaking words in half to begin a new line. And that is a hint to you that you might have run into the Google Docs error. So if you want to do the uh, extra credit for a higher grade before you and you use Google Docs. If you use Google Docs before you submit, remember to check whether you have this problem. Okay, that's Moodle. Do you have questions about this? Okay, so if you don't have questions, I'm now going to pass out the handout. OK, so you guys have the very red handout. So let's begin the introduction to films and filmmaking. The most important thing to remember when you're watching a movie is that everything you see is the result of a choice. There are no accidents in filmmaking. Even if it looks like an accident, somebody had to look at it and say, that's fine, I accept it. What this also means is that filmmakers have an unbelievable level of control over what you see. Um, a simple way to say this is that most of what you see is fake, but of course it's not that simple. Think about an image in a movie. Who is in it? Who's the person? Do you know the person? Are they a man, a woman, or can you not tell? What are they wearing? 
what kind of clothing from what historical period or is it from the future? What color? What fabric? Does it fit the character? What about their hair and their face? What does their hair look like? How does their face look like? What kind of person is this character? Are they living a good life or are they suffering? Or are they normal? Where are they? What kind of place is it? Is it indoors? Is it outdoors? If it's outdoors, is it in a city? Is it in nature? Is it in a visually generated computer simulation? Why are they there? How is the person standing? Where are they looking? What are they doing with their body? In the background, what kind of place is it? But also what time of day? Is it morning? Bright noon, dark night, can you not tell? What's the weather like? Is there wind? Is there rain? Is it hot? Is it dry? Why are they there? Also, what color is the entire image? Like, yes, there's color on the clothing, there's color in the objects, but what about the entire image? Does it look more yellow? Does it look more blue? Does it look more brown? What kind of objects are in this location? Are they personal? Are they everyday? Are there no objects? Are they utilitarian? Functional, right? Are they pretty? Are they expensive? Are they carelessly thrown about? And when the camera moves, first of all, does the camera move? And if it does move, how does it move? Does it go like this? A very, uh, we call this a dolly. Or does it go like this? We call this a pan. Or does it go up and down? Uh, again, if you go straight up or down, this is called a, a crane. Uh, but if it's a tilted up or down, it's called a tilt or a, also a pan. Or does it zoom in or does it zoom out or does it like circle around and always, always, always why? When you change to the next scene, where does the first scene stop and where does the next scene begin? Why does it end there? Why does it begin there? What are we missing in the middle? And why did the filmmakers think that it's fine to skip that middle part? And when you combine different scenes into acts, to long sections, what parts of the action are we seeing? What parts are we emphasizing? And what parts are we moving fast over and skipping? And again, why, 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 why? If everything we see in a movie is the result of a choice, every choice has a reason. Sometimes the reason is very artistic, right? The director believes that doing this would be better to create a character. It could be more beautiful. It could be more emotionally powerful. Sometimes the reason is there wasn't enough money. That's also very common. Uh, and if you go watch like a superhero movie, sometimes the reason is we want to prepare you for the next movie. It's also a reason. But everything is there for a reason. Uh, and especially if you watch like animated movies, like uh, animation, cartoons, anime, sometimes the reason is we didn't have enough time. Uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, Transformers 3, San. There is a shot of a guy looking at a lot of computers of very small screens. And it's a very short, it's a very brief shot. But if you pause and you look closely, you will realize that some of those screens are empty. It's blue, like a blue screen. Um, and that's clearly because they ran out of time, so they skipped the details. 
but everything is there and everything looks like the way it looks for a reason. Somebody thought about it and said, uh, calculating what I want to do, what I can do, what resources I have, putting it together, I think this is OK. So if we think about movies like this, then we can take apart every element of a movie and think about what it's doing, why it's doing it, and how does it affect the rest of the movie. And that's what we're going to be doing using the handout. But before that, the word movie. Why is it called a movie? It's actually exactly what you think. It's because it moves, so it's a movie. The, the proper name for a movie is called a motion picture. Uh, and that's why if you watch the Oscars, the best, the, the winner of the biggest award is called the best picture. In Chinese, we just call this Zhe Jia Yingpian. Um, motion picture gets abbreviated to movie. It's not the first time. Before movies had sound, today we call those movies silent movies, mo pian. But when they first got sound, people called them talkies because you could hear people talk. So this is not a new language situation. It happens every time something changes. There are a few other names for movies. The name of this course, film literature, film. Film refers to that uh, plastic that captures the images using a chemical process. Today, Almost everybody uses a digital uh, film camera, but the name film is still there. We still call it film. Another common name for movies is cinema. The word cinema comes from the Greek kinema, which means movement. So actually, when you say cinema, you're still saying movies. Um, so that way, when, uh, now you know whenever I say cinema or a motion picture, you know what I'm talking about. We're always talking about movies. OK, so let's uh, jump into the handout. I have divided filmmaking into, I think, six departments. There are more than six departments. If you look at the Oscars, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, is the organization that gives out Oscar awards. They have divided filmmaking into, I think, 19 departments. Uh, too complicated. We're, we're only here for 18 weeks. We don't need to talk about 19 departments. So I have combined a few and put a few together, and we're going to talk about six, I think, uh, around six uh, major filmmaking departments. Uh, this handout gives you a brief explanation of each thing and also explains some vocabulary. And hopefully with a common vocabulary, we can communicate more effectively. So the first one, the directing department, is led by the director. It's also known as Video Village today because some directors uh, don't focus too much on the actors, they look at the video screen to see what uh, the audience will see. So often directors will be sitting somewhere surrounded by video screens. And so some people call this department Video Village. The director is usually the person who provides a vision for the film. Usually, not always, but usually the director is the person who says, OK, this is the I have a story and this is how I see the story on screen. Like when you take a situation, this is how it will look. This is what the people will do. The director is the person who answers everybody else's questions. Oh, what should this person's hair look like? Oh, what kind of object should we use? Oh, how should the camera be pointed? The director is the person who answers these questions. Uh, so the director oversees the filmmaking process. Now, of course, making a movie is a very difficult thing to do, requires a ton of people. So the director cannot make every single decision, but the director will make sure that what other people decide fits with their vision for the whole movie. 
Uh, one way to think about a director is the director controls how a movie feels. You can have the same story told in many different ways, um, but a good director will make sure that every decision fits together and it feels like one movie. Uh, sometimes it's not the director who does this, especially if we watch older movies. Uh, the, direct, the director only really gained power around 1960, 1950. Before that, the most powerful person is the producer. We're going to talk about the producer later. Um, so because there are so many things to do, the director will divide other jobs to assistant directors or ADs. The first assistant director will help to manage the set, the place where they're actually making the movie. So like the director will make decisions and the first AD will help make sure that people follow those decisions, um, that everybody is taken care of, nobody is forgotten, nobody is neglected. They help to make sure the food gets here, very important. The second assistant director, second AD, helps to manage the cast and crew when they're not at work, or I should say the cast and crew when they're not actually in the middle of a shoot. So, you know, you have a large group of actors, but not everybody is in the same scene. So if an actor is not in the scene, they'll go off to take a rest. And the second AD is the person in charge of taking care of those people. Um, making a movie is very much a kind of hurry up and wait kind of activity. A lot of waiting, but suddenly you will have many things to do, and when you're finished, you go back to keep waiting. So when you're waiting, the second AD is the person who will take care of you. The third AD, sometimes called the second second AD, takes care of people when they're not on the set. So sometimes an actor or a crew member will not be needed for the whole day. So they have the day off, they can stay in their hotel, they can go sightseeing if they're in a location. And the second second AD will make sure that these people are not lost, are not injured, right? To take care of the people when they're not on the set. Also, uh, I also put screenwriters in this department, honestly, because I don't know where else to put them. Screenwriters are the people who actually write the script. Um, OK, screenwriters. Screenwriters are often considered the least important person when making a movie. And this is because once they have finished writing the script, you don't really need them. Some directors like to keep them on set so that if there are problems with the story or with logic, they can talk about it and find a way to solve the problem. But some directors just rewrite the script themselves. Uh, and they don't work with the screenwriter after they have finished the first draft. So if you look for a screenplay or a script online, sometimes you will see things like first draft, Final draft, shooting script. A shooting script is when the director takes the final draft, tries to make the movie, runs into some problems, and rewrites the script to solve those problems. That's the shooting script. Um, screenwriters are sometimes people who can write about their own ideas, but many times somebody will give them an idea and ask them to turn it into a screenplay. And in fact, there are many situations where uh, the idea that a screenwriter gets is actually an earlier draft of the same screenplay, but the director or the producer thinks there are a lot of problems. I want you to rewrite the whole thing. Um, so in fact, for movies, especially big movies uh, that cost a lot of money, uh, and so people want to make sure it, it, they get it right, a screenplay can go through many different writers and many different drafts before they start making the movie. Before you start making the movie, this period is called pre-production, When you make the movie, it's called production, 制作, 
when you, everything you do after you put down the camera is called post production. The screenwriter very definitely belongs in the pre production stage. OK, under screenwriters, we have executive producers. In Chinese, we call this jin zi. What do executive producers do? Nobody really knows. Uh, the, well, some executive producers just give you money, and they give you enough money that you have to put their name in the movie. But there are also executive producers that will look at what you have so far and give you guidance and give you advice. But usually they will not actually go to the movie set and give you specific recommendations. They will not do specific jobs. So their job is basically to give guidance and support to the director, including monetary support. Uh, some executive producers are simply the head of the production company that helps you make the movie. So production companies will work on more than one movie at the same time. Um, and so the head of the company will not always be involved in any single movie. But because they're the head of the company, you have to give them credit somehow. And so you can give them an executive producer credit. Uh, next, we have other people who help the director, technical experts, historical consultants, anybody who can give you necessary information. Um, especially if you're making a historical film or a sci-fi film that uses complicated technology, directors often want to make sure that the details are not too wrong. It doesn't matter if it's 100% right, but they want to make sure that they don't get too many angry emails or comments. And so these are where the technical experts can help the director. So um, two vocabulary items for the direction department. Um, the two main jobs of a director when actually making the movie are to guide the actors and to guide the camera. So when the director is guiding the actors, it's called giving acting direction. And where, when they're guiding the camera, it's called giving camera direction. Next, we have the production department. This is the department that's in charge of the physical environment. The setting, the background, the location. Um, everything that is not the actor. Every physical thing that is not the actor is the responsibility of the production department. The production department can be very small. If it's a small movie, you might have three people. But if it's a huge movie, you might have hundreds of people. It depends on how much uh, money you have and how much time you have and how much detail you want to have. So the head of the production department is the producer. The producer controls the budget and the schedule. They are in charge of time and money. So of course the producer will work with the director very closely. Uh, the producer will say, OK, you have this much money, you have this much time. And the director will say, OK, here's how, how we're going to do this. Uh, and we'll continue with the production department after a short break.
the producer controls the time and money. If it's a small movie, the producer can do everything else. But the bigger the movie, the more people will be needed. And so the more levels of control will be needed. So depending on how many levels of control you need, uh, the people who work under the producer are, can be called the line producer, the production manager, associate producers, uh, and then the smallest ones are production assistants. Production assistants are like interns, Gongdusen. They're the people who get coffee, they're the people who make reservations, that kind of thing. And these people all help the producer take care of details. The higher level people, like line producer, production manager, will take care of like different parts of the filmmaking process. Uh, and then the lower levels will take care of individual tasks. But they all work under the producer to make sure that the film keeps going uh, under budget and on time. If a movie spends over budget and goes over time, there's a certain level of flexibility. The production company will give the director and the producer a little more money, a little more time. But if it gets totally out of control, uh, what happens is when you make a big movie, you have to buy insurance. The, there are insurance companies that specifically sell insurance to movies. And the insurance says, if you run out of money or you run out of time, we, the insurance company, will make sure you finish the movie. So if the filmmakers spend too much time or money, they can lose control of their movie. And the movie production goes to the insurance company. And of course, the insurance company don't care about art. They don't care about how good a movie is. They care about trying to make back as much of the money they lost as they can. So usually when that happens, the insurance company will try to end the movie as soon as they can and shove it into theaters to hopefully get back a little bit of their money. Um, so it's always a good idea to try to be on time and under budget. Next is the production designer. This is the person in charge of how the physical environment looks. If it's an indoor set, pretty obvious, right? They design uh, like the walls, they design the windows, they design the furniture and uh, the decorations, the objects, everything. But if it's an outdoor production, if they're shooting somewhere out in the real world, the production designer can decide, should we change how this building looks? Should we change these road signs? Should we change the color of the... Um, Grass. There is a story I remember on one film, the production designer thought that the grass was too brown. So they hired a bunch of people to paint the grass green for the movie. Um, so even outdoors, the production designer has a lot to do. And of course, uh, there will be people working under the production designer to help build things and paint things, uh, stuff like that. Harrison Ford, Hari Shmi Futa. In his younger days, when he was not working as an actor, he was working as a carpenter, Mu uh, Jiang. And one reason he could do this is because there are carpenters working on a film set. Um, so he knew what they were doing. Next, the location manager. So the production designer is in charge of how the uh, physical environment looks. The location manager is the person responsible for finding shooting locations. If the director says, OK, we're going to shoot this movie outdoors, the location manager has to listen to what the director wants and go out in the world to find a place that matches the director's vision. And when I say go out in the world, I do mean go out in the world. Today, movies are made worldwide. Um, a lot of Western movies are made in Budapest, Budapest, in Hungary, 
because it's cheaper to make to it's cheaper to fly everybody to Budapest to make a movie there than it is to make a movie in New York or Los Angeles or wherever they are. Movie making today is a global business. So, uh, for example, Kristen Stewart, right? Uh, recently said that the next thing she's going to do is she's going to direct her own movie and that she recently worked with her location manager and they found really great places to make the movie in Latvia, Latvia. So a location manager really has a big job. And once the location manager finds the place, usually what happens is they will go, they will take pictures and videos, and they will talk to the director and show the director these images. And if the director says good, then the location manager will take the director to go and see for themselves. Uh, but once the director says, OK, let's make it here. The location manager then has to get the right to actually make the movie here. If it's on public property that belongs to the government, they have to ask the government's permission. If it's on private property that belongs to like a store owner or a hotel owner or even like a private home, then they have to ask the permission of the owners. Uh, and when I say ask, I really mean pay. They have to pay the government. They have to pay the owner of the land or the building. Making a movie costs money. One million dollar budget is considered a low budget movie. Um, and so like this is one reason why it's so expensive to make a movie in a big city like New York. So like let's say you want to shoot on this street in New York. First, you have to pay the city government to let you use the street to close off the traffic so you don't have random cars going in. Then you have to pay every single store owner on the street because when you shut down the traffic, they lose business. So let's say you need one week on this street. You have to pay every single store owner one week's worth of income. And then they'll say, OK, fine, you can make the movie here. And that's not even counting the cost of if you want to shoot inside a store and you need to change the way the store looks like. Let's say you're making a historical movie. You need to take out all of the like electronics. You have to replace all of the like the water faucets and the furniture. If the building does not belong to you. Then after you're finished shooting that part of the movie, you then have to put everything back as it was before. So like if you're shooting a historical movie in this shop, you have to pay the owner to let you use the shop. You have to pay to take out all of the stuff and put in other stuff. And after you're done, you have to pay to take out the new stuff and put in the old stuff. It costs a lot of money. And th this is all the responsibility of the location manager. The location manager directs this process. Um, so those are the manage the manager uh, management jobs. Underneath that, we have people who actually do the work. Grips are the people who move equipment, and there is a lot of equipment, right? Cameras, lighting, uh, uh, like tables and chairs, generators if you're shooting outdoors, um, materials that you need, um, like electrical cords, satellite dishes, all of that stuff. Grips are the people who move that. Then you have gaffers. Gaffers are the people who work with electricity. If you need to set up a light here, you need to connect it to the power grid. And so gaffers are the people who like work with electrical equipment. Especially if you're shooting out in the middle of the forest, gaffers are very important. And then you have all the other people you need. Caterers are in charge of the food. You have drivers, you have medics, especially after COVID-19. Every film set needs a dedicated COVID medic. Uh, the US says that the pandemic is over, but Hollywood does not agree. So even today, Hollywood has dedicated COVID medics and uh, the filmmakers still have to wear masks and, and gloves and all that stuff. Uh, and all the other people you need to create a physical environment for the movie. 
Uh, so some vocabulary for you. I, I introduced some of these already. Production is the stage of filmmaking where you actually pick up the camera and you take in the images. The set is where the production happens. Uh, so if you uh, if somebody is on set, that means that they are part. They are in the location where they're making the movie. And if they're off the set, then they have left the location. Um, this can be important when you talk about people who are not actually in the movie, but who have to be there to take care of other things on set. A sound stage is an indoor set. This is where like uh, you can build the environment from the ground up. You can build everything exactly as you want it. A studio lot in Chinese, we call this ding chen. This is where um, you have a lot of pre-built environments that have been used for other movies, and the production company thinks these environments could be useful. Maybe we'll use them again, and so they keep them somewhere. Or if it's a like a building, they'll just leave it there. And so if another movie needs a similar environment, they can just go here and use an indoor environment that has already been built and you can save a little money. Uh, and then if you're shooting outdoors, it's called a location. And so if you're on set outdoors, it's called being on location. OK, so far so good. Do you have questions so far? All right. So the next one, the acting department. I have to say acting is a very mysterious process. Think about this. An actor. Has to use the words on the page to create a whole new person. And they have to understand this person's thinking, this person's life experience. They have to know how this person would talk, how they would react to different situations. They have to know the relationships between their character and the other characters. But the only way that they can express all of this is by reading the lines on the page. It's like pretending to be somebody else, but you can only do what somebody tells you to do. It, I, I personally think it's a miracle every time we believe an actor's performance. Um, and if you've ever seen a so-called bad actor in a Hollywood movie or in like a popular movie or TV show, you should know that even the worst actors on screen are much better than what an average person could do. It's like saying that you think this NBA player is terrible. You're not going to win against them, right? They're still much better than you are. Um, so like even the worst so-called worst actors are still pretty good compared to people who are not professional actors. So who else besides the actors uh, is in this department? The casting director. To cast someone means to choose somebody for a movie, uh, to, to choose an actor for a movie. Uh, so the casting director is the person who works with the director to choose the actors. Sometimes a director will know the stars that they want. They will know the, the lead male and female actors. But there are many, many, many people in a movie. Most of them you will not know. They are not famous. They are not rich. They are what we call a jobbing actor. It's their, it's their daily job. The casting director is in charge of finding all of those people. So not just the famous people, the famous people, the director or the producer will usually choose. Um, it's everybody else that the casting director has to look for. So once you get all the actors together, if you put them together, you call them the cast. That's everybody, all the actors. Um, but uh, an actor is only the beginning. How do they look? You need to decide uh, their hairstyle, their makeup style, their costumes, their wardrobes. An actor is like a blank 
canvas. It's not blank. Well, yes, it is. An actor is like a blank canvas. The canvas is made of some kind of material. It has its own color. But that's just the starting point. What do you paint on the canvas is what matters. Um, so that's the outside look of the actor. Then you have how the actor moves and talks. So a dialect coach is somebody who works on the actor's pronunciation. Sometimes an American will be playing a British person. Sometimes a British person will be playing an American person. Sometimes a Malaysian person will be playing a Chinese person. You, the actor has to change the way that they pronounce words. This process is actually very different from what we do. Like, if you ask me to do a British accent, I can do a very terrible one. But like the way that we usually do accents in daily life is we listen and we try to make those sounds. But for a professional actor working with a dialect coach, to really get an accurate accent, you begin with the shape of your mouth. And you analyze like which parts of your mouth goes to which positions in order to say which words. Um, so like when Kristen Stewart made Spencer, right, the movie about Princess Diana, it's the first time in her career she had to do an accent. And so during the award season press tour, she kept talking about like, oh, how much exercise it was for the mouth and how it really changed her um, physical acting because of the way she was using her mouth. Um, so we also have stand-ins, Tison. Now, of course, there are a number of reasons you might need a stand-in. Maybe it's a stunt, uh, and you don't want to put your actor in danger because they're very famous, and if they get hurt, you have to spend a, more time waiting for the actor to get better, and time costs money. So instead of letting the actor get hurt, you use a stand-in, so if anything goes wrong, the actor is still fine. Another reason you might have a stand in is maybe there's a sex scene and the actor's contract says I will not do sex scenes, but you think that this scene is very important. So you will get a stand in to do that part of the acting uh, so that you don't violate the actor's contract. But there's also another reason you might want to stand in. Remember, time costs money especially if the time belongs to a famous actor. And when you're preparing to shoot a scene, most of the time will be spent on preparation. Where do you put the lights? How strong do you use the lights? Where do you put the camera? Does everything look good? Part of that is how does the actor look in this situation? Is the light... Uh, bouncing off of them correctly. Can you see them clearly? Are there any weird shadows? The proper way to do this is when you finish setting everything up, you put the actor there and then you adjust. But during this time, the actor is not acting. They're standing there costing you time and money and you don't even get to see them do their job. So one way that filmmakers used to save money is when they need to adjust everything for the actor. They don't use the actor. They use a stand in. Stand ins cost less money. And so if the whole day is just preparation and the actor doesn't actually have to act, then you can let the actor have a day off and you don't have to pay them that day. Uh, some stand-ins are not a full body stand-in. Sometimes you need somebody to do something with their hands or, or another body part. You can hire a stand-in for those particular shots also. And other necessary people, anybody who can help an actor or uh, anybody who can help a director direct an actor would belong here. So, you know, actors also have to do research. If they're playing a professor, they have to know what a professor does. If they're playing an archaeologist, they have to know what an archaeologist does. 
Um, so the director does research, but the actor also does research. And those are the some of the necessary people that I'm talking about. OK, uh, there's actually a recent movie about actors doing research. It's called May December. Very funny movie. It's, it's a very uh, dark comedy, uh, but it tells the story of an actor who is preparing to play a character based on a real person. OK, some vocabulary uh, from this department. A line is a sentence of dialogue spoken by an actor. So like if you see a screenplay, right, it will say, oh, this person says blah, blah, blah. Every sentence of dialogue is called a line. So when an actor says a line, we say that they're delivering a line. It's a line delivery. Uh, or another way to say this is a line reading. They are reading the line out loud. But when we say line delivery, we're actually talking about how does an actor interpret a line? A line is a sentence on a page. There are many different ways that you can read a single line. Um, for example, a very simple sentence. John was late today. If I say it like that, it's just a simple statement. Maybe somebody's asking me, uh, what happened? I say, oh, John was late today. But you, there are many different ways you can deliver this, right? John was late today, not Mary, John. John was late. He's usually on time. How is he late today? Or John was late today. I heard he was late last week. There are many different ways to deliver each line. Uh, and so some actors have found very creative line deliveries, very creative ways to show their character by putting their own interpretation onto the same sentence. Uh, my favorite example is in the first Top Gun. Have you guys seen the, the first one? Okay, anyway, so uh, Tom Cruise has like a nemesis played by Val Kilmer, who's called Iceman, and they don't like each other. Uh, in one scene, they end up in the locker room together, and it looks like they're about to get into a fight. But then Tom Cruise delivers his line not in a violent, aggressive way. He delivers his line in a sarcastic, cold, ironic way. And irony creates distance. So even though he's still insulting the other guy, it's preventing a fight. Um, and so the movie can continue instead of like seeing two guys go up against each other and have to find another way to end the fight. Um, so it's a different way of interpreting the same line. Um, if this extends to not just the, the line, but the performance, we call that an acting choice. So not just one line, but how does an actor understand their character? How does an actor perform the character? Um, I, my favorite example is actually not from movies, it's from theater. So you guys know there's this story, uh, okay, you don't have to know, but there's a story called The Elephant Man. Uh, it's the story of a guy who's disabled because, and his disability makes him look like an elephant. Uh, so on stage, Bradley Cooper once played this character, and the way that he chose to do this, his acting choice was to always keep one arm like in front of him, like an elephant's nose for the whole performance, which is kind of crazy, but apparently people said that they believed it, so whatever. Um, so that is a very obvious acting choice. It's how he chose to perform his character. Um, now, especially for animated movies or other movies where you don't see the actor, their performance is called voice acting. Uh, so, you know, of course, animated movies, but also voiceovers, narrators, pang bai, right? You hear the voice, you don't see the person, so their acting is limited to voice acting. 
Some people are really great voice actors, but they're not famous because they're not good physical actors. The next one acting using the body. Uh, and so, you know, today movies are popular for one reason, because we love to watch uh, handsome and beautiful movie stars. But some people are great at voice acting and they don't look like movie stars and they don't do physical acting very well. On the other hand, sometimes movies will cast famous people in voice acting roles. Some you might have seen this, right? An animated movie full of really famous stars. But when you watch the movie, you kind of feel like, eh, the acting's okay. And that's because you're used to watching them. You're not used to hearing them. And it turns out very good physical actors often are not very good voice actors. Uh, you guys know that Taylor Swift does movies, right? She was in uh, Cats, terrible movie. She was also in an animated movie called The Lorax, and I have to say her performance in that one was even worse than in Cats. Her physical acting is okay, but her voice acting is terrible. And she's a singer, so it's very ironic. Anyway, um, some other ideas we can talk about. The idea of a movie star. Some people think that a good actor is supposed to disappear into their character. When you see the character in the movie, you don't think, oh, that's that famous actor. You believe that it really is the character. But sometimes movies depend on the fact that you know the famous actor. The, the best example is, of course, the Mission Impossible movies. If you replace Tom Cruise, it's not a Mission Impossible movie anymore. Even if the character's name is the same and the script is the same. It's a kind of movie that really depends on having a star. So sometimes the, the actor fits the character. Sometimes the character fits the actor. It depends on the movie. Uh, but also stars can also give uh, good performances where they disappear into the characters. Uh, like uh, Tom Hiddleston playing Loki. Before he played Loki, he was not seen as like a, a impish, ironic, funny guy. He disappeared into his character and his character changed how we see him as a star. Tom Hiddleston actually started out as a very serious actor in small movies. Um, actually, so did uh, Robert Downey Jr. Downey. He also was a, started out as a serious actor. A lot of actors actually like start out serious and then like they make a big movie and people discover them and they become a star. It's a very uh, interesting situation. And then you have people like Kristen Stewart. <laughs> she makes five really big Twilight movies and everything else she makes is a small movie. And so people still remember her for playing the young girl who fell in love with a glittering vampire. Next, we have the cinematography department, otherwise known as the camera department. This half of the word should look familiar, right? This is the second half of photography, seeing, uh, zhao But now it's not just a static photo, it's a moving photo. So it's a cinematography, movie cameras, basically. This department is led by the director of photography, also known as the DP or the cinematographer. Now, on big movies, the DP doesn't actually hold the camera. The DP designs how a shot looks. They talk with the director to make sure they know what the director wants. And then they set up, they design where the lights should go. They design how the camera should move. And then they check with the director, is this what you wanted? And then they adjust until they get it to what the director wants. But the DP themselves usually do not actually hold the camera. So the first job works with the director to translate the director's vision into images. And the second job is to oversee the creation and adjustment of the images. So the DP is actually a manager. 
Well, the DP also has to like choose make technical decisions. So not just where do you put the light, but what kind of light do you want? What color? How bright? How hot? Do you need it to change? Do you need it to move? And also for the camera. Oh my God, cameras are really, really complicated. Uh, first decision, do you want to use a film camera or a digital camera? And then like if you want to use a film camera, what kind of camera stock? What kind of film? Uh, the smaller ones, 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter, the bigger ones, 65 millimeter, 70 millimeter, IMAX, uh, different kinds of physical film. And then the camera. How big a camera do you want? Do you want like a, a really powerful camera, but you can't move around? Or do you want to be able to move around and the image will be slightly lower quality? What kind of angles in the image do you want? Do you want to be in focus in front or in focus in back? Do you want the image to be square or rectangular or like curved? Um, depends on what kind of lens you use, Longjing. Just like a, and then after you choose the technical uh, equipment, then you have to choose the company. Like there are many different, not many, there are a number of filmmaking camera companies that make similar equipment. So let's say you want to use a digital, powerful uh, 35 millimeter film camera. Do you want to use this company or that company? Uh, a good cinematographer will know a little bit about all of this, and so they can talk with the director and um, they can see what kind of equipment. Can best realize the director's vision. Under the cinematographer, you will have the people who actually again do the work. A camera operator is the person who picks up the camera and guides it who actually uses the camera. A lighting technician is the person who picks up the lights and and modifies them exactly as the DP wants it. A focus puller. OK, this is fun. When you use your phone to take a picture or take a video, you usually don't have to care about the focus. All right, the camera will adjust itself. But a film camera will never adjust itself because some filmmakers want an image to be out of focus. You just so sure. So if you need an image to be in focus, you have to have a focus puller. Actually, literally measure the distance between the camera position and the actor position so that they can adjust the focus. Uh, this is not too hard if it's a it's a, a static non moving shot. Camera stays here, actor stays there, uh, they act over. That's fine. But if it's a moving shot, then it gets complicated. If the camera is moving and the actor is moving and there are lots of things happening, the focus puller has to make sure that they know the distance between camera and actor for the whole moving scene. Uh, it doesn't have to be like 100%, right? If you get around 90%, that's fine. As long as the focus is on or close to the subject of the shot. Uh, do you guys watch American late night TV? Do you guys like, for example, uh, the late show with Stephen Colbert? So if you watch American late night TV, you will notice, especially uh, the show with Stephen Colbert, every night, Colbert is out of focus every night. It's very clear. If you look at his table, sharp, clean. If you look at his face, kind of blurry, kind of fuzzy. And that's on purpose because he's what, 60 years old? If it's too on, in focus on his face, you can see all the lines and all the wrinkles and stuff. So they use a slightly blurry focus to make him look better. Uh, so that's one example of how focus can be important. If you watch older movies, uh, like black and white movies, 
when the two, like if it's a romantic comedy and the man and the woman are supposed to fall in love, then you will get a shot of the woman that's very out of focus because it's supposed to make her look more beautiful or whatever. That's what they used to do. Um, yeah, so focus is also not just like, is it in focus or out of focus? Focus is a filmmaking tool. Uh, next, you have the colorist. This used to be called the color timer. So the director will say, I want the color to look like this. And so the DP will choose a camera lens or a color gel or a film stock that can create that color. But the colorist is the person who actually creates the color. Um, so when they used physical film, uh, they had to take the negative deep in and they had to soak it in chemicals to bring out the color. And depending on how strong the color you want, how dark or how bright you want it, you will leave the film in the chemicals for longer or shorter periods of time. So that's why the person who does the color is called a color timer. They time how long before they take out the negative from the chemicals. Uh, but today, mostly it's done digitally. So you don't have film stock, you don't have chemicals. The colorist kind of uh, takes the, the digital image and adjusts the overall color and then adjusts the specific color of different elements uh, to make sure it's what the director wants. OK, um, some vocabulary items. The frame. OK, so when we talk about um, cinematography, it's going to get a little bit abstract because you didn't so The frame or the camera frame is the boundary of the image. If it's in if something if you can see something inside the image, it is in frame. If you cannot see it, it is out of frame. Now, there, because it's the boundary of the image, when the camera moves, the frame also moves. Um, now, some things are out of frame when like you can hear somebody talking, but you can't see them. They're like in another room. Then that person is out of frame. Now, usually when you watch like a popular movie, you expect everything important to be in frame. If it's important, we should see it, right? Not always. Sometimes we'll, a filmmaker will think it's more important to look at something else. Uh, actually, just yesterday, I finished watching a movie called Memoria by uh, Abhichat Pong Weerasethakul. And that movie focuses on sound. We're going to talk about sound later. S but you're watching a movie, right? How do you get the audience to focus on the sound instead of the image? Uh, and his solution is don't look at the thing that's creating the sound. Look at the person who is hearing the sound. When you like when you listen, when you listen to music, you can hear the music, but like if you're wearing earphones, nobody else can, right? So if you look at somebody who is listening to music, it can be kind of boring. You don't really see anything. They're just sitting there listening. But if you so and so in that way, the filmmaker can take your attention away from the image and make you focus more on the sound. So the use of a camera frame is also a very important tool. Uh, you can always think, why are we looking at this? Why are we not looking at something else? Next, we have three different kinds of camera shots. A close up is a shot by a camera that is very close to its subject. So like usually uh, from the neck up if it's a person or like very closely focused on an object. Uh, the third, the last one, a long shot is a camera that's very far away from the object. So like you have a big image and the important part is one small part of the shot. In between is a mid length shot, something in between 
close up and long shot. If it's a person, usually it's from the waist up. Um, now you might think, wh why does it have to be so complicated? Why can't you just use a mid length shot for everything? Right? If you shoot everybody from the waist up, you won't miss anything important. Could be true. But then the movie gets really, really boring. Uh, have you seen? Jesus Christ, what is it? Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch did a movie about Alan Turing during World War II, the guy who broke the German Enigma code. Uh, can't remember what it is, but like in that movie, it's very obvious that the director was like, fuck it, whatever. Every shot was a mid-length shot. And so for a long period of time, people were talking to each other. The subject matter was exciting. It's something we should care about, but it just feels so boring. You get one shot of a white guy from the waist up talking to another white guy with, from the waist up, uh, shot after shot after shot. It all looks the same. So there's a reason why filmmakers change camera distances. Uh, it's to help you focus on what they want you to focus on, to emphasize the important parts and to de-emphasize everything else. If anybody uh, finds the name of that movie, please let me know. OK, so far, do you have questions? OK, um, and you know, camera movement, we, I already talked about that at the beginning, right? You have um, a dolly shot, which is when the whole camera moves. You have a pan shot when the camera stays still, but it looks left, looks right. Uh, a crane shot is when the whole camera goes up or down. A tilt shot is when the camera stays still and it looks up or looks down. Um, an arc shot, or today we might call this a drone shot, is when the camera circles the subject. Um, and then you have like weird stuff like a Dutch tilt, which is when the camera is uh, on a canted angle. It's like not 90 degrees. Lots of crazy stuff you can do. Uh, when you talk about film cameras, it can get very technical. OK, next is the editorial department. So up to now, you have your actors, you have your physical environment. You picked up a camera, you captured the images, you added color. Great. Now you have to put these images together. And that is the job of the editorial department. The editorial department basically only has one person, the editor. Sometimes a movie will have more than one editor, but the editor doesn't really need a lot of people to help them. What they really need is time. Editing can take a lot of time. And that's a warning for you too. When you are doing your group project, editing will take a lot of time. Um, like you will be amazed how much time you need just to make a 15 a minute short film. So the editor works with the director to put the images together. It sounds simple, but there are many, many, many different choices to make here. First of all, uh, which scenes in which order? Yes, the script tells you first this, then that, but maybe the director has other ideas. Maybe the director wants to mix things up a little. Then in the same scene, usually uh, there will be shots from different angles. So for this shot, do you want the first angle or the second angle? How long do you want the shot to be? Do you want to keep it on the same image for longer or do you want to quickly switch to the next image? Then even for the same angle, there will often be more than one take. The, the actor will act, the, the, the cameraman will c capture the image, and then the director will say, that's good, try it again, take two. Uh, it'll happen again, they have another set of images, the director will say, great, let's do it one more time, take three. Same angle, same actor, same scene, which one do you use? Which image do you use? 
Um, and so when you and then also when you change between images, how do you want to change? Do you just simply want the first image to stop and the second image to begin immediately? That's called a smash cut because it's very violent. No transition. Boom, next one. Or do you want to use a dissolve? Dan chu, dan ru. Uh, do you want to use like a, a fade to black? Dan chen hei de hua mian, and then change to the next image. Um, sometimes you might even want to freeze frame. Ding ge. All of these are what the editor has to decide working with the director. Uh, usually what, what it looks like is uh, the editor will have an editing machine. Today it's a digital editing machine. In the past, when you used physical film, it's a, literally a machine you use to cut and paste segments of film together. Uh, and then the editor will use film glue or film concrete. For some reason they call it concrete uh, to connect different parts and then run it through the machine and it will show what it looks like. Uh, today it's digital. And the editor will control the machine and the director will stand or sit beside them and say, <laughs> OK, this one. Stop, start, use that one, know that one. And the editor will basically try to uh, understand why the director chooses this and not that and to help the director put the movie together. OK. Um, some vocabulary. That's a lot of vocabulary. Let's take a short break. We'll talk about the vocabulary when we come back.
Okay, some vocabulary items related to editing. So when we were talking about cinematography, we mentioned that the frame is the boundary of the image. But in editing, a frame is a single static image. Right, so in cinematography, we say the frame, but in editing, we say a frame. So a frame is a single static image. Traditionally, a film camera captures 24 frames per second. So when you use a traditional film camera and you hear the whirring sound of the camera, it's the shutter, like a, the gate, sorry, the gate of the camera going up and down, up and down 24 times per second. Uh, so a frames per second FPS. Some directors like to use a faster or a slower FPS. The faster the camera goes, the slower your image. Does that make sense? The faster your camera goes, the slower your image. Think about this. If you think about this using traditional film, so like a film goes through the camera at the same speed. So if your camera goes faster, more light and more imagery comes onto your film per second. So if you have more images in your in, on your film, then when you play it back at normal speed, you will have more material, so it will look slower. If your camera slows down, then every frame will have less information, less light. So when you play it back at normal speed, it will feel faster. So a faster camera gives you a slower image and a slower camera gives you a faster image. So a single image is called a frame. When you put all of the frames together for a certain section, that is called footage. You cannot count this word. This word is uncountable. Footage refers to all of the recorded frames for the section that you're talking about. So like the director might ask the DP, uh, did we get good footage today? And the DP might say, yeah, we got a lot. Or uh, no, some parts we have to redo later. Um, a take. I used this word earlier. The technical definition is from a, a section of footage from when the camera starts running to when the camera stops running. So it actually doesn't have to do with the actor. Um, especially today when we use digital cameras, uh, you don't have to stop to save money. Like actual physical film is very expensive. So in the past, the director would try to save money by stopping the camera when you don't need the image. But today, digital images are very cheap, so some directors will never stop. They will just keep going and going. So like if the actor fucks up and they need to redo it, uh, the director will say, take your time and the camera will keep going. And so the actor can take their time and prepare to go again. But technically, it's still the same take. Um, so in the editing bay, when the editor is choosing between takes, the take that they finally choose is called a shot. And when the editor changes from one shot to another shot, that change is called a cut. And the verb is to cut, to cut between shots. Uh, there are two ways to think about this. You can either say that this is the separation between shots, or you can say that this is what connects to different shots. Uh, and so there are different ways of cutting. We talked about a smash cut, no transition, boom, next shot. 
there's also fast cutting like in an action scene. You have many different shots in a short period of time. This is called a fast cut or fast cutting. Next we have a scene. This word is less related to the technical camera or film. This is about the story. A section of the story that is focused on a single event or idea or location or person. Uh, in Chinese, we call this imu. Uh, in order to present a scene, usually you will need more than one shot. So all of the shots you use to present one scene are called a sequence. A sequence of shots or a series of shots. And then finally, one kind of sequence is called a montage. In Chinese, we call this mong tai qi. And this is where you are using relatively fast cutting in order to present the passing of time. Uh, the classic example is like a sports movie when the sports person is training for the, uh, the competition. You don't really want to see them train like eight hours every day, right? So that part moves very quickly. You get one uh, short shot of them doing this activity, then you have another short shot of them doing another activity, and so on, and you put them all together and you add exciting music, and that becomes a montage sequence. But it doesn't have to be training. It could be anything. Uh, if you guys watch uh, Shinkai Makoto films, Shinkai Chen, he loves using this, right? Uh, the character says, oh, we have to do this. And so they set off to do something, and you have very quick shots of different locations set to Japanese pop music. That's also a montage sequence. The word montage is very interesting. We use the word montage for this meaning in English. And also in Chinese, because Chinese took this word from English. But the word montage is French. In France, montage just means editing. So if you watch a French movie, and at the end of the movie, they have the credits of everybody who worked on the movie, you might see the word montage. And that just means this is the editor. And so if you talk about film with a French person, uh, make sure you know what you're talking about when you use this word. Next, sound department. Now that movies have sound, you also have to worry about the sound. Again, when you use your phone to record a video, it records the image and the sound. Not true for film cameras. Film cameras only record the image. I mean, the film cameras are already huge. Have you seen a film camera before? Huge. You don't need to add extra equipment to record the sound. But the real reason is because the sound that you record is often not usable. Think about it. When you record a video uh, on your phone, what kind of sound do you get? The sound from the person, but also traffic, nature, wind, somebody walking behind you, your, your finger touching the microphone. All of those sounds are not what you want in a movie. So the way that movies capture sound is separate from the image. There are two main ways. One way is you use a boom microphone. You've seen those guys holding the microphone, right? And the microphone is like right on top of the actor. Those microphones are very specifically directed. It's a very small area of sound capture. Uh, so it's easier to uh, not capture all of the other noise if you put it right on top of the actor. Um, and this is when it's important to know where is the frame of the image. You're not supposed to see the microphone. So the boom operator has to know how low can they put the microphone 
before it enters the image. That's one way, and this is often used indoors. But if you're in a very noisy environment, especially outdoors, then what they do is they recreate the sound later. And they match it to the image. So they'll get the actors in a recording studio. They'll play a section of imagery over and over, and the actor will have to time their performance and like recreate the sound of their voice acting. Uh, they do the same thing for sound effects. Like if you see somebody wearing high heels walking on a wooden floor, there's no microphone for that. They had to recreate that sound later and then match it to the image. We're going to talk about all of this. So the person in charge of the sound department is the sound designer. Uh, and you might think sound is just sound, right? You see something, you use that, you try to recreate that same sound. But there's also some choices to make about sounds. Like, yes, you want to hear the actors. Most of the time, sometimes you don't want to hear the actors. Have you guys seen Lost in Translation? So at the very end of the movie, Scarlett Johansson and Bill Murray are saying goodbye in the middle of a busy street. And Bill Murray bends over and whispers something into Scarlett Johansson's ear. And we don't hear it because it's supposed to be a secret, a private secret between the two characters. Um, so even actors, uh, what they say, you sometimes don't want to hear it. Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan sometimes will prevent you from hearing what his actors are saying. Many people think he's crazy for this. The actors are actually saying something. It's important. It has information. And Christopher Nolan says, no, no, no. I want you to hear the noise, not the actors. Crazy guy. Um, but then you have sound effects. When you walk around in daily life, there are so many sounds happening around you and you ignore most of them. Because they're not important. In a movie, therefore, which sounds are important and which should be ignored is something that the sound designer will discuss with the director. Uh, when something goes wrong in this part, it's very obvious. Like when you see a character shut a door and you don't hear the door, it's suddenly very obvious there's something wrong with the sound. But if you see them shut the door and you hear the door, you don't notice anything because it sounds natural. Um, so yes, the sound designer works with the director to make choices about the sound. The sound effects are created by the Foley artist. Uh, and the name of this job is because the person who invented the job is named Jack Foley. So they named the job after him. Now again, you might think sound effects. That's not too hard, right? Like uh, you, you hear a sound, you just do the thing and you point a microphone at the thing, right? Not true. The job of a Foley artist is not to give you the original sound. The job of the Foley artist is to give you a convincing sound. For example, have you ever punched someone? If you've ever punched someone, what sound does that make? No sound. Uh, skin on skin contact is very soft. Skin is soft, skin is soft, soft and soft does not make a sound or a very light sound. But when you watch a movie and two characters fight each other, full of noises, right? Boom, pow, wham, thud. Those are all convincing sounds. They're not realistic sounds. Uh, the classic example is when a horse walks on a street and you hear the sound of their hooves on the concrete. Have you ever have you guys ever seen a real horse walking on a real street? 
Have you heard that sound before? It sounds like uh, pebbles, 小石子 uh, hitting the ground, and it makes sense because a horse's horseshoe is metal. It's solid metal. There's no space for a sound echo. But if you see a horse on a movie,、uh, you hear the clop 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 sound because it's more convincing. It's not what it really sounds like, but we're used to it. And so traditionally, the way to make that sound is you get an empty coconut shell, yezuke, and you bang the two shelves,、uh, the two halves of the shell against each other to make that sound. Or like going back to the punching and the fighting, how do you get the the punch sound? One way is、uh, to fill a pillowcase with. Cotton or some、uh, soft substance, and you take a baseball bat and you whack the pillowcase to create that sound. So sound effects are not straightforward. It depends on how convincing the sound is, not how realistic the sound is. Next one, ADR, automated dialogue replacement. This is when the actors go to a recording studio and and, and、uh, match. And recreate the sound by matching it to the image. This is usually done by an ADR engineer, a professional who knows how to use that machine.、Um, if you've ever tried to recreate、uh, your own voice, it's not easy. Usually, we talk and we don't think about things like rhythm, timing, loudness, the shape of our mouth. We just talk. Who cares about that? But if an actor has to go into an ADR studio to re-record their dialogue, they have to care because the sound that they say has to look like it comes from that image. So what happens is the ADR engineer will take a section of the movie and they will play it on a loop over and over and over. And each time it begins again, the actor has another chance to try to match that image, and they'll keep going until they get it right, or the actor needs a break.、Uh, and of course, if you're doing an animated movie, this is just how you record the the voice acting.、Uh, although for an animated movie, sometimes. Some animated movies they will design the character based on the voice actor, especially if the voice actor is very famous, like a star. They'll try to make the character look like the actor. In that case,、uh, what they'll do is they'll first have like a very simple drawing of the character doing something or saying something, and the actor will give a vocal performance, and then the animators will go back and draw the actual character and match the image. To the sound, instead of the sound to the image, it's more work for the animators, but it's easier for the actor. Aside from naturalism, like、uh, voices and、uh, sound effects, you also have music. Most movies have music. There are many different ways to use movie music.、Uh, sometimes music helps to tell you. What you should be feeling at this moment. I don't think that's a good thing, but that's what movies do. Sometimes movies will help you, like you already feel something, and the movies will add to that feeling. The music will add to that feeling. Sometimes the music is there to tell you information. Like maybe a character will have a theme music. Every time the character appears, the same music appears. And so, if you hear the music before you see the character, you know that the character will be appearing soon. So that's one way music can convey information. So there's a process here also. Usually, a music soundtrack will have two different kinds of music. One is.、Uh, Commercially available pre-recorded songs, like a theme song, or like a pop song, like、uh, you guys go see Barbie. Barbie has a very good、uh, soundtrack full of popular songs. 
The other kind of music is music recorded specifically for the movie. This is called a score. We also call it background music. Beijing, right? A score is usually written by an uh, actual composer. Um, and what happens is usually what happens is the director will finish the rough cut of the movie. It bas it's basically done. Maybe you need to add some special effects. Maybe you need to change the color, but the editing is done and the images are all the ones that the, you want. Then the director will take this rough cut, show it to the composer and say, OK, can you create a score for my movie? And the editor, uh, sorry, the director will talk about the ideas, the feelings, what's going on here, what's going on there. The composer will take notes, take notes, take notes, go back and write music that fits the rough cut. That's usually what happens. If the composer is very famous, like Hans Zimmer, uh, the guy who did the music on Inception, Tremien Chi Dong, right? That guy. Hans Zimmer does not actually write his own music. He has a studio full of apprentices. He will talk with the director, bring the director's ideas back, decide how to turn those ideas into musical ideas, and then uh, divide the work among his studio apprentices and the people who work for him will then create the actual music and he will put it together and give it back to the director. If you're famous enough, you can do this. Hopefully one day I will be famous enough. I don't have to teach you. Um, that's usually what happens, but sometimes, sometimes the director will think the score is so important I'm going to do my editing according to the score. So, for example, uh, I mentioned Spencer, the, the Princess Diana film starring Kristen Stewart. That film was edited according to the score. They got Johnny Greenwood, the guitarist from Radiohead, to do the score. And so the director talked with him about the ideas, gave him a script, showed him what the picture the like the progression of the picture will probably look like you know how does the character feel here how does the character feel there greenwood went back he did the score and after he finished the score he gave it to the director and then the director start worked with the editor to put the images together to fit the score so if the score is important enough sometimes uh, you will see a reverse process like this OK, so once you have all of these sounds, you need to do two more things. The sound editor matches the sound to the image. So in the past, when sound was new, you had a soundtrack, uh, you had an image track and you had a soundtrack and you had to fit the soundtrack to the image track by cutting, pasting, arranging and make sure they match. Today we do that digitally again, all digital. Um, but sound editing is not just about making sure the sounds are right. Sound editing is also very creative. Uh, again, for a certain image, you can have various choices of sound. Which kind of sound do you want? But also sometimes you want an image without sound. Have you seen Star Wars The Last Jedi? I don't know the Chinese title, whatever. Um, Star Wars Episode 8. It's the one where the Empire is attacking the rebels and the rebels are trying to run. And then um, uh, what's her name? Who's the female character played by Daisy Ridley? Yeah, anyway, she like uh, goes into a cave and discovers herself, whatever. The climax of that movie is silent. There's a big explosion, but you don't hear it. That's a choice. That's a sound editing choice. Um, in fact, this choice was so unusual that American theaters had to put up signs telling people, no, the sound is not broken. It's supposed to be silent. 
So not the sound is not always naturalistic. And then you have the sound mixer. For every image, you will have more than one sound. Maybe you will have the score, you will have actors dialogue, you will have noises. So the sound mixer decides which sound is the loudest, which sound is the second loudest, and how loud are they relative to the other sounds? If you play all the sounds at the same volume, you can't hear anything. It's just one big noise. So the sound mixer has to choose for every single frame. 24 frames per second for a two hour movie. Every single frame, the sound mixer has to adjust the volume of the different sounds. Um, so these are all parts of post production, and this is why a movie can be finished shooting and then take six months or a year to finish post production because this shit takes time. Oh, yes, I mentioned last last uh, period. I mentioned a movie starring Benedict Cumberbatch, the one with the very boring mid length shots, the imitation game. Mofang Yoshi. OK, last one. The effects department, the fun stuff. There are two kinds of effects. Special effects called SFX are done in camera. They happen and then you capture the image on camera. They happen during production. The other kind. Visual effects or VFX are also called post production effects. They happen after you have the image and you do something to the image. So let's talk about special effects first. There are many different kinds of special effects. Um, back in the old days before you can use a computer and CGI, um, filmmakers use things like trick angles. You set things up exactly so that when the camera looks at it, it looks like something dangerous or something terrible. But if you look at it from a different direction, you don't see anything. It's an illusion, Huanjue. Uh, trick angles and forced perspective, right? using camera, the, the location of the camera and playing to the camera. Uh, oh, one famous example is like a, um, Charlie Chaplin, he did a lot of dangerous stunts, but he also did some stunts that were not dangerous at all. It just looked dangerous. Have you seen those uh, internet photos of like an artist drawing on the street and it looks like he has opened up the gates of hell? Or like there's like a, a pool of water or like a mountain cliff in the street. But then if you step to the side and you look again, it's just a painting. That's forced perspective. Uh, so filmmakers used to do this a lot. Another way uh, to create special effects is to use models, otherwise known as miniatures. Xiaoxing Moxing. If the shot does not have actors in it, if like you're showing Godzilla destroying a city, you don't have to build a city and then create a Godzilla machine to destroy it. You can use miniature models. Take a small Godzilla, build a small city, and have it like step on the little tiny buildings and just film it from very, very close, and it'll, it'll look very big. And then you can add the sound effects later to make it sound like Godzilla is destroying a, a city. They did this a lot on Star Wars, the original Star Wars. Like all of those shots of like the TIE fighters and the spaceships, all of those were miniatures. And they, they used wires to hang them in front of a background and they put the camera there and they took individual photos and like they moved this, the ship a little bit, took another photo, moved the ship a little bit, took another photo, and they put them all together, added sound effects to make you think you're watching a spaceship move. Uh, SFX also includes explosions. Good news, those are real explosions. You can't fake an explosion without a computer. Those are real. But an explosion in a movie is still very different from an explosion in real life. 
when was the last time you saw a car crash that ended with an explosion in real life? Never, not even on the news. And but somehow it happens in every action movie. Those are obviously planned. Uh, it is possible for a car crash to end with an explosion, but a very specific sequence of events has to happen. One car has to be hit in the gas tank. The gas tank has to break. The gas has to leak. And then uh, uh, somewhere the electrical parts have to be hit also. There has to be electricity sparks and the sparks have to hit the gas and then it'll blow up. Very, very few car accidents fit those uh, criteria. Uh, but in an action movie, two cars hit each other. Boom, big explosion. Although I guess like in recent years, it's gotten slightly better. Like uh, if you watch a James Bond movie in the past, he would just take his gun, bang, 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 the car would blow up. Now he or like a Mission Impossible movie, he takes his gun, bang, bang, bang. He has to wait for the car to flip and so he can shoot under the car and hit the gas tank. And then the car blows up. It's not realistic, but it's better. Like if you if you take a gun and you shoot a car's gas tank, more likely than not, it will not blow up. Um, but at least it looks more realistic. So um, when a film needs explosions, the point is not to destroy the thing. The point is to have a big, beautiful fireball. Um, so often when you're shooting a film with explosions, the thing that you're blowing up does not have to be big. Uh, the explosion itself does not have to be powerful. It just has to look good. Um, of course, it's still dangerous, right? You're using actual explosions and actual fire. It will always be dangerous, but it's not as dangerous as a real life explosion, like uh, a construction company that needs to blow up a mountain. Those are much more dangerous. And you can tell that the explosion is not that dangerous when you see the actor like walking away from the explosion, right? The action hero saves the girl and they're walking away and behind them, bang, big, beautiful fireball. If that were a real explosion, the actors would be hit and on the floor immediately. But because it only looks good, then you might like see a little wind blowing from behind them and that's it. Um, so if you do an explosion, you need to have an explosive expert who knows how to add dynamite and explosives and bombs to the thing you're blowing up. They usually have an external trigger. So like when you sh when you see the hero shooting the thing, that's not what blows it up, right? Somebody else is standing away and they press a button and then it blows up. Uh, and then, of course, if you do explosions, you have to have a fire team. Somebody standing by. If it gets out of control, they immediately come to put out the fire. Uh, and then uh, the last one I want to mention here is the stunts. Uh, right, so you have a stunt coordinator and stunt people. The stunt coordinator uh, is usually the person who designs the stunt. And when I say design the stunt, um, usually the director will decide, OK, I this is what I want to see. And the stunt coordinator will say, OK, this is how we can do it so that it's safer. So what it looks like is the director's choice, but how do you do it safely is the stunt coordinator's job. They say in the movie business, a good stunt design is never dangerous. I think that's half true. Obviously, there is going to be some danger involved. What they mean is if you follow the directions, you will not get hurt. Um, I also have a funny story about stunt coordinators. So Matt Damon once said that uh, he was at like an event or something and he's sitting next to Tom Cruise. Uh, and Tom Cruise was telling a story about making one of the Mission Impossible movies. I think it was the one who was climbing the Burj Khalifa in uh, Abu Dhabi, right? Not Panaga, Bodhi Tasha, right? That's one man Palantir. 
that stunt. And he was saying, um, I told the stunt coordinator, this is what I want to do. Uh, help me design this. And the stunt coordinator thought about it and said, Tom, I don't think there's a safe way to do this. Uh, and Tom Cruise looked at him uh, and he, he said, OK, I'm going to go find another stunt coordinator. Um, usually, if a stunt coordinator tells you there's no safe way to do this, you should not do it. But if you're Tom Cruise, you simply find another guy who will let you do it. Um, so that's the stunt coordinator's job. And then the people who perform the stunts uh, are usually also stand-ins, not the actual big star. Most stars don't do their own stunts. Um, stunt people are trained so that uh, even if things go wrong, they are less likely to get hurt. So like if they accidentally fall, they know how to fall safely. If something like snaps or breaks, they know how to get out safely. Of course, it's still dangerous, um, but it's slightly more likely that they will survive if something goes wrong. Um, now, I said that most stars don't do their own stunts. So sometimes in a movie, you will see something dangerous happening, and then you will see a shot of the star. And then you will see another shot of something dangerous happening, and you will see a shot of the star. You will notice there's always a cut between the star and the stunt. And that's how you know that the star is not actually doing the stunt. Um, what they do is they create a situation in the middle of the stunt that looks like it is part of the stunt, and they get the star there and they capture the image, but it's not actually doing the stunt. There are some exceptions, right? Tom Cruise, Keanu Reeves, Emily Blunt. Some actors are willing to do the training and the safety training to be able to do their own stunts, uh, or at least some of the less dangerous stunts. Blake Lively also uh, does her own stunts sometimes. Um, and then sometimes the whole thing is not actually a stunt. It's, it's fake. Um, have you noticed in action movies when two characters get into a fight, suddenly the camera starts moving crazy and shaking and you can't really see what's going on? That's because it's not really dangerous. They're not actually fighting. Um, but they don't want you to know that. They want to make it look exciting, so the camera just moves around. This actually, uh, this I don't think it's a good thing, but when it started, it wasn't like this. The first movie to really uh, like move the camera in crazy directions during a fight scene, uh, in the popular imagination, the, the first movie to do this was uh, The Bourne Identity. Uh, the Bourne films are the, the ones starring Matt Damon as a spy who lost his memory. God, I need to know the Chinese titles of these films. Um, the director, Doug Lyman, thought instead of just capturing an image of Matt Damon fighting, what if we followed every single action? So like when his fist is hitting the other guy, the camera follows the fist. When he picks up a toaster to hit the other guy on the head, the camera follows the toaster. Now, of course, every action is very short. So you end up with a sequence of very fast cutting. One action cut, one action cut, one action cut. It looks like the camera is moving in crazy ways. But if you watch closely, everything makes sense. The camera is always following something. Uh, and people love that shit. People thought it was the best thing ever. And so the next Bourne film did the same thing. But then the next other action movie started using it as an excuse. Instead of actually following something, they just shook the camera to tell you, oh, it's an action scene. You guys saw The Hunger Games, right? The first one, Jennifer Lawrence. Eh, pretty good movie, but the action sequences were terrible. Uh, when Katniss is running through the woods, it's not even a close shot. It's a far, it's a long shot. She's running away in the woods over there, and the camera is still shaking. Doesn't make sense. It's simply to make you feel excited. Um, 
the most memorable uh, memory of this I have is um, there is a small movie called The Accountant starring Ben Affleck and Anna Kendrick. Uh, and in that movie, there is near the beginning, there is a very, very short fight scene. Uh, two bad guys come and try to attack Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck like punches two or three times and he wins. Simple, right? But in the actual movie, the camera again goes crazy for like five seconds. Um, but then if you watch the B-roll, a B-roll is when you have another camera recording the making of the movie, like uh, something like that. When you watch the B-roll, the B-roll camera is not moving. So you can see exactly what's going on. And what happened was Ben Affleck didn't even try. He was like, whoo, whoo, and he wins. Uh, that, of course, doesn't look exciting. So they had to move the camera to fake like it's an exciting fight. Uh, yeah, so that's a little bit of movie making magic for you. OK, last one, visual effects. These are the things you do after you have all of the images put together. So the most obvious one is when you have to put words on the screen, opening titles, end credits. How do you put them there? What do they look like? If you're blocking something in the image, what are you blocking and why? Especially opening titles can be very creative. Again, James Bond, opening title sequences are uh, traditionally very creative, but also like the Spider-Verse movies, right? Into the Spider-Verse, across the Spider-Verse. Those opening titles were really good. Uh, then you have blue screen and green screen compositing. The idea is you know that there will be images added later. So for the background, you use a green screen or a blue screen or some other color that is very unnatural. And then later on, you use a machine and you replace that specific color with another image that you want. We do this all the time when you uh, do a video conference. You use Zoom or Teams and you turn on your camera and you want to block your background. You're what you're doing is you're telling your camera, OK, focus on me. Everything behind me that is not me replaced with another image. It's the same idea, except uh, for your uh, computer camera, the key is distance. If it's far away, it will replace the image. For blue screen and green screen, it's color. If it looks like this color, it will replace the image. So it has to be an unnatural color. That way uh, you can guarantee nothing else will be replaced by accident. They could do this before computers. It's called uh, image compositing or image replacement. Another way is rotoscoping. This is replacing images by hand. So not according to color, but an artist will take a film image and they will draw around the part that they want to keep and then tell the computer to replace everything else. Frame by frame, again, 24 pr frames per second, two hours, frame by frame, they will draw around the image and replace everything else. Takes more time, but you have more control over what you can replace. Number four, motion capture or mocap. This is when like you're creating like a 3D movie, a 3D animated movie, or like a 3D CGI creature, uh, and everybody else is a real person. So, you know, you see the actor wearing the crazy like rubber suit with the dots on it, right? And they're performing like a monster and it looks stupid. But after you use a computer, um, you can tell the computer like, OK, you give the computer a 3D monster and you say, OK, this point fits to this dot on the actor. That point fits to that dot on the actor. And you basically put the monster onto the actor's uh, suit. And that way, whatever the actor is doing, the monster is now doing. Fun story, when they were making Cats, the director had no experience making live action 3D movies. So he forgot to tell the actors to put on motion capture suits. So later when the animators had to turn the actors into cats, they couldn't just match the dots and tell the computer, OK, replace. 
the animators had to pick points by hand every single frame for every single actor to replace. And that's why that movie was almost uh, not finished in time. Because the director was stupid. So having a good director is very important. And then finally, CGI, computer generated imagery. This is basically everything else. Um, CGI, of course, is used for like the big special effects, the stunts, the explosions, whatever. The like uh, uh, monsters and like aliens and cool transforming cars. But CGI is also now being used to save money. If you watch a Marvel movie and there's a scene like uh, if a scene happens in Nick Fury's office. Nothing big. Two characters sitting in a room talking. That will probably be CGI. It will probably be two actors sitting in front of a green screen and they will add the office background in later. In fact, there might not even be two actors. If you don't see two people in the same shot, it's probably one actor talking to a tennis ball. And then later the other actor in the reverse direction talking to another tennis ball. In fact, even if you see two actors in the same shot, did you guys see um, everything everywhere all at once? So some of those shots, uh, one character is in one timeline or universe and another character is in another universe and somehow this character enters that universe. Two people in the same shot, but actually the directors planned it very carefully. The two actors never touch. So if they keep the camera in the exact same place with the exact same setting and background, first they get one actor to do this, then the other actor to do that, and they don't touch, then they can go back, use VFX to combine the two halves into what looks like the same shot. So when people say that CGI is killing movies, they're not talking about the big monsters and special effects. They're talking about replacing the little stuff to save money. Think about it. Which one is cheaper? You build an office set to shoot for one minute, and then you destroy it and recycle it. Or you use a green screen and you create an office background using a computer later. CGI is much, much cheaper, especially because CGI artists are often overworked and underpaid, like myself. Um, they don't have a union. It says a visual effects studio. These are often subcontractors, Wai Bao Sang. So it's hard for workers in different companies to come together to ask for more pay, less work. And the big movie studios know this. So they will, if you watch the credits of a big movie, it will often be more than one VFX studio. Same movie. OK, this studio does this scene. That studio does that scene. This studio does another scene. And that way, these workers are all competing against each other for the lowest price. And the movie studio gets to save money. But of course, the people who actually suffer are the CGI artists, because to do a good job, you do have to spend time and spending time should earn you money. But if you're a CGI artist and your company is trying to win a contract using a low price, your company may not have enough money to pay you. This is also a big problem in video games. Um, so next time you watch a big CGI action movie, remember that people are suffering for your entertainment. OK, done. Questions? You have 30 seconds. Questions? Great. Next week we're going to watch Day for Night, and then we'll talk about documentaries. Reminder, the movie will begin as soon as the bell rings.